All right, everybody, welcome back to another Shots from the Winchester podcast presented by Greencastle. And today I have a very special guest with us, Mr. George March, and we're going to learn all about his time in the Old Guard and his time as a leader in the Pennsylvania State Police. So welcome, George. We're so glad to have you. Thank you. I appreciate the invitation. All right, great. So let's just like get right into it then. How did you end up in the Army? Well, there were certain coming of age times when you're younger. When you're 13, you become a teenager. When you're 16, you can learn to, you can drive, you get your learner's permit. When you're 18, you can register for the draft. And of course, when you're 21, you know what you can do at 21. <laughs> well, when I was, at the time I was approaching 18, you could go and register for the draft a couple of months early. So it was in Coatesville, Pennsylvania, a big elaborate uh, marble building there. Uh, from the turn of the century and the draft board was downstairs in the lower level of it at the end of a long hallway. So I went down there about a half an hour before the draft board opened and I'm sitting on a bench outside and I hear the door open at the top and someone coming down the steps and there's a young fellow comes down he's got a suit bag over his shoulder walks up to me and says what are you doing here? I said I'm here to register for the draft. He said well they'll be open in about a half hour you can come I'll you can you can go in when they open. So he walks down the hall on the other end, goes in, shuts the door. About 10 minutes later, the door opens and out he comes and he's the United States Army recruiter. And he walks up to me and he says, do you really want to be drafted? I said, no, I don't want to be drafted. I want to go into the army. I want to enlist in the army. He said, well, that's what I'm here for. He said, why do you want to enlist in the army? I said, because my father was a paratrooper during the Second World War and jumped into France and I want to do the same thing. He said, oh, well, if you get drafted, they'll put you wherever they want to put you. If you enlist, then you, you can choose, if you pass a test, that you can go into what they call a military occupational specialty. So he said, I can give you the test and if you're willing to take it. So I went down, took the test, and he's scoring it, and he's looking and scratching his head like this, and he says, you want to go into the airborne, right? You want to be a paratrooper. You want to jump out of airplanes, right? He said, that's a military occupational specialty, and there's a test for that. He said, well, I'll tell you, you've got a high enough score. You can do that. So I said, okay, fine. So then I went down, I registered for the draft, and my father said to me, how'd you make out at the draft board today? I said, I made out fine, but I got a paper here for you to sign. And he said, I didn't know I had to sign a paper for you to register for the draft. I said, it's not for that. I said, I enlisted today, a, a deferred enlistment. He said, oh. He said, what'd you enlist for? I said, for the airborne. I, I said, I, was, I got a high enough score on the test to go in the airborne. He said, son, you can get a zero on that test and go into the airborne. <laughs> so I went in the Army. I was selected to go into uh, a supervisor school uh, to be a squad leader. So I stayed another couple of weeks there. And then I went into another uh, advanced infantry training unit. I was in advanced infantry training, got back from a marching uh, te test one day. And uh, the first uh, the drill sergeant said, March, Mars, Cooper. The first sergeant wants to see you. Well, you didn't want to see the first sergeant when you were a private. <laughs> Went into the first sergeant's office and he said, one of the things that we do, we're responsible for looking at seeing who might be uh, good enough at the manual of arms and marching and so on to go into the old guard and be one in the ceremonial unit in Washington, D.C. Did you ever hear about that? I said, no, I didn't, but I'd like to give it a try. He said, well, if you go down there and try out and they don't select you, then you're going to go wherever the army wants to send you. I said, good enough, I'll go try. So I went down and I was successful at the, in the test and I was assigned to Honor Guard Company and I became a casket bearer in Arlington National Cemetery for, Ar for Army casket bearing. And another one of the platoons there in Honor Guard Company was uh, the firing party that, that did the firing parties at the few military funerals. The Fife and Drum Corps was there, the Army uh, drill team was there, and the Tomb Guard platoon was there as well. So uh, I was admiring these fellows at the tomb guard. So I talked to the platoon sergeant and I said, how do you get to be a tomb guard? And he said, well, you come on out here uh, to the amphitheater and we'll train you. Uh, if you're successful in your training, then you can be a tomb guard. So fortunately, I was able to go out and I was selected to be a tomb guard there. So that's how I got on the mat at, at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. So, so I, I didn't know that you just kind of like went in and they hand selected. So did they do that based off of that like just observing you and and you know when they said like you to go see the 
the first sergeant? Yes, in the advanced infantry training, yes. Yeah. It was one of the jo one of the jobs that they'd had was to watch over the people in their training uh, platoons and see if there might be a candidate there that might be march and do the manual of arms well enough to be a candidate for the old guard. Wow. So that's how they did it. And, and so there you were. Yes. So yes. What was it like? I mean, that it's such a like a, a niche part of the army that there's so many people that don't understand, you know, that whole unit, the culture, any, everything around it. So what was it like being a part of the old guard? Uh, very interesting, uh, very strict. It's a part of the military district of Washington. So you had uh, your tactical responsibilities as well, in addition to your ceremonial duties. So uh, that you were always training for the ceremonial duties, parades, things at the White House, around town, uh, like that. We actually went one time, we flew out to Chicago to do a ceremony before they opened the Army in one of the, a big game, football game out there. Uh, but it, it, you always had to be very strict as far as your bearing and your, your uh, behavior and your uniform and your dress and all that sort of thing. Um, the uh, casket bearing was interesting. Uh, the the caskets that are taken into Arlington National Cemetery, the casket bearers themselves are from the branch of service that the individual served in. The caisson platoon that takes the caissons out with the horses and the carriages and so on, they're done by the Army. Uh, but each one of the branches of service has their own. So I carried many caskets for Army veterans that were buried there as well. And uh, it was during that time that, that I uh, was attracted to the tomb and was able to go out there. This was in, I got to the tomb in October 1963. President Kennedy was killed in November of 1963. And the two army casket bearers for his uh, casket, Jim Felder, who was the sergeant, and Doug Mayfield, who was the uh, corporal there, and uh, Sam Bird, who was the lieutenant in charge of Kennedy's casket, uh, were <laughs> were practicing carrying the casket with other members of the military, other branches of the military, because all the branches of the military carried President Kennedy's casket. And they had never practiced that way together before. So they came, at, I was on duty at the tomb. When you're on the tomb, you're on a 24-hour shift. And at nighttime, the, the cemetery is closed. So Sam Bird called. He knew what I had served as a casket bearer. And he said, we need to practice carrying the casket up the steps there below the tomb so that everybody can carry the casket up level. He didn't want it to be canted, so mm -hmm. this. So, so they came out and they were practicing carrying President Ken an empty casket, of course, mm -hmm. up and down the steps behind the tomb to make sure they did it correctly. But then Jim Felder, who was in charge, the sergeant there, uh, actual one of the bearers, said to me, he said, uh, can you come on out here? This casket is not as heavy as what President Kennedy's casket is going to be, and we need some weight on this casket. So he said, we'd like you to sit on top of this casket while we carry it up and down the steps to get the weight correct, you know? So I did that. And then the next day was President Kennedy's funeral, so I served in President Kennedy's funeral cortege as well. So that was very interesting, very interesting. Wow, that is incredibly interesting. Yeah. That's that's an incredible, very interesting, sad, obviously, but very incredible sad. experience to be a part of too. Um, so you talked about like them having to practice. So what what kind of training goes into all of this? Not not just with like the the casket bearing, but just in the old guard in general. There's so much precision. So yes. what amount of training? Yes. What kind of training? Well, uh, it is of course manual of arms, and the manual of arms had to be done strictly according to the um, the. the the manual that was published mm -hmm. and it had to be done in a very sharp consistent way everybody had to uh, be trained so that when they were moving their hands their arms the, the weapons they were moved exactly the same way everybody else was moving them no different no difference in the timing of it all the timing had to be correct the the stature of an individual marching had to be straight level and so on the, the pace had to be at exact 30 inches the arms had to be swung at the right, right cadence and so on. So there was a lot of training to make sure all that was done absolutely properly. Uh, at the tomb, of course, it was different because when the soldiers walking, the sentinel is walking on the mat in front of the tomb, it's 21 steps to go from one end of the mat to the other. Then the facing movement, the manual of arms, 21 seconds in one face, 21 seconds the other way, 21 steps back the other way, 21, 21, 21. 
in, in recognition of the 21 gun salute, the highest salute. So when you're there, uh, you had to, you, you couldn't blink, you know, because people were taking photographs and they didn't want a picture of a sentinel with his eyes closed, so you couldn't blink the whole time, so you had to train how to keep your eyes open for an hour. Uh, at the time, uh, they wear sunglasses now very often. They actually changed the guard wearing the sunglasses. Back then, in 63, we did not do that. You could put the sunglasses on after you were on the mat. The uh, commander of the relief would come out, put you in what we called a box, and where the soldiers, the sentinels would go when there was a wreath laying ceremonies. They would put the glasses on you, come back out. Before the changing of the guard, they take the glasses off again, so there were never any sunglasses worn. But you had to walk straight and level, and the manual of arms had to be very, very precise as well. So there was a lot of training. Downstairs, underneath in the amphitheater, is where the training took place, and the tomb guard quarters were downstairs in a portion of that amphitheater as well, and still are today. And so I heard a really cool fact that this is something I don't think the general public knows. You were assigned a number when you're there, right? Yes. And, and then in order to go into the quarters, you have to announce yourself as that number, is that correct? Yes, you, you can visit the tomb guard quarters today. Uh, there is a, a button that you could push with a little intercom there, and you announce yourself according to your tomb guard identification badge number. Mine is 28, so you'll say 28 is here for a visit. If they are not awfully busy down there, they may bring you into the tomb guard quarters and uh, introduce you to the sentinels who are there uh, in training and so on to spend some time with them and tell your stories versus their stories, you know. <laughs> Which so, is yes, very different. Do that. Yeah. So you had 24 hour long shifts. Yes. <laughs> uh, logistically, like, did you get a bathroom break or was it just, I, I know that may sound silly to you because you've done it, but to the general public, like, was it t truly 24 hours, just back and forth, 21 paces back and forth? Well, uh, they, they were called a relief, first, second and third relief. So. They were 24 hours, and then you had 48 hours off to do your tactical training, to, to get your uniforms ready for the next time out, and so on and so on. But during that 24 hours, it depends on how many Sentinels were actually on that relief, how, many, how much time you had spent up on the plaza on the mat. If there were three Sentinels, it used to be an hour at a time. Now it's a half an hour in the summertime before they change the guard, an hour in the wintertime. At nighttime, after the cemetery closes, it's always two hours. Mm. And it's a little bit more relaxed at nighttime uh, during those two hours because you're responsible for the security of the whole area there around the tomb. So you get off the mat, you're not precisely doing the 21, 21, 21 all the time, and you can move around to make sure there's no threats being coming to the tomb from anywhere else. During the daytime, uh, we were up, you'd change the guard, and then you were there for an hour. The next sentinel would come up and go on, and you'd be off for maybe two hours. If there were three sentinels, sometimes if there were only two sentinels, you'd be an hour on, an hour off, an hour on, an hour off, and so on, during the time that the cemetery was open, and then two hours at nighttime. Wow. So why are they called sentinels? Do you know the history behind that? Sentinel. Uh, that's another uh, term uh, anonym, synonymous with guard. So, yes. Some call, you t they call it the tomb guard. They don't call it the tomb sentinel, but the sentinels are, you know, we know ourselves as sentinels, right? Okay. So you have all this discipline on duty for those 24 hours yes. that you're either pacing back and forth or you're waiting to do that. What about off duty? Is there that, that same discipline level expected of you? The, uh, when you're, when we had the two, 24 hour periods where we were not at the tomb, then you would have like a daytime responsibilities, uh, preparing for the next time that you would, the first day off, you would make sure that all your uniforms were prepared and ready to go for the next time you went on. In the summertime, you'd be up there for an hour and you would sweat so much that you couldn't wear the same uniform for the next time you went on. So sometimes you had to have three or four different uniforms ready to go for the next day. Uh, shining your shoes, they were always spit shined at that time. I think they still are today. In the bright sun, the sun would dull the spit shine, so you had to shine the shoes again, and you would have two or three pairs of shoes that you'd have spit shined, so you could always have them ready to go when you got up. And then the third day, 
so when you were off duty, then you would have normal off duty time. You you could you know go out in in town, drive around, do do whatever you were permitted to do, going off post. Uh, on the third day, you would mostly be doing tactical training to keep up with the level, uh, because you were a, a United States Army regiment and responsible for uh, responding to calls in in the Washington D.C. metropolitan area. Uh, so you had to keep that level of training there as well. Sometimes you would go to an army post nearby to qualify with the weapons and retrain that way. Uh, but uh, sometimes you would have enough time off that you could, like I lived, three hours away. So sometimes when I was on the off time, I could get a pass and go go home uh, for an evening and then come back the next morning so I could get back the next morning. Wow. Yep. So... You mentioned three uniforms that you had to have sometimes if it was like a hot day, you had yeah. to have multiples ready. How long does it take to get one uniform ready? And then also, how long does it take to kind of get your weapon ready? Because I know part of um, the experience is doing the um, inspection kind of where you're changing the guard, yes. right? So, Well, uh, in the guard quarters, there's a rifle rack down there and there I don't know how many are actually there today, but we used to have four or five, six different rifles. M M1s what is what we were using when I first got there. Matter of fact, I was the last Sentinel ever to carry an M1 on the tomb. The next Sentinel that came up the next morning, uh, Robert Reamer was in the first, uh, first relief. He was the first one to carry an M14, which they're still carrying today. But uh, you'd have four, anywhere from four to a half a dozen different rifles downstairs there. and course while you were off duty as if they needed a, not off duty but not upstairs on the plaza on the mat then you'd be responsible for making sure everything downstairs was taken care of as well wow. so what we didn't mention yet is that it, you have these shifts no matter what weather yes so have you done it in like really miserable weather and yes. if so what was that like uh, the uniform is different if it's raining. Uh, there's a raincoat that is worn with a hat cover, uh, but it's, you're still out there marching the same 21 steps. Uh, in in the nighttime, uh, in the box there, you could get out of the weather a little bit, standing in the box, making sure you're looking around. Uh, but in the daytime, uh, you're still up there on the mat, 21, 21, 21, the whole time. Winter, summer, rain, snow, wind, doesn't matter. There's actually an internet which would, something was published on the internet that an order had been given by the generals in the military district of Washington because of a hurricane or something coming up that the sentinels were to go off the mat and go down into the quarters so they wouldn't get harmed and that the sentinels refused that order. That's not true. No such order ever came. Uh, the sentinels would be there no matter what the weather is. Wow. That's incredible, honestly. So you had this amazing experience that not many people have, and I guess before we move into what it was like the transition out of that, do you know how many Sentinels there have been or there are currently? Uh, in 1958, uh, the, the Department of the Army decided that they would have a particular uh, badge issued, a Tomb Guard Identification Badge. Uh, my number is 28, so I was the 28th Sentinel from 1958 when I started in 63. At first, when the Tomb Guard Identification Badge was uh, awarded, then it would be only worn while you were active duty military, and then it would be given back. Now, it is something that is awarded and stays on your uh, DD-214 mm -hmm. as a permanent uh, award. Uh, the ba I was the 28th one to get it after it had been created. Today, there are slightly over 600, so from 1958 until today, uh, so some 60 some years about 600 have been awarded which is still and, not that many <laughs> no that's true and the Society of the Honor Guard is making an attempt to identify the Sentinels by name who were Sentinels on the tomb ever since they were first put there in the early 1930s right I think I saw 1937 mm -hmm. was about the year that they had started doing that which yes. is it's incredible so what I was going to say is then you had this experience, it's a really rare experience, obviously only 600 people to this day have had that experience. What made you want to transition and get out of the military at that point? Uh, I had a three-year enlistment and uh, my enlistment came up in September of 65 and then I went into the reserves for three years. So it was just end of service you know, I reached, okay. yeah. 
And then what was the difference for you between doing that and the reserves then? The reserves, uh, it was every, it was inactive reserve, so it wasn't something you had to go to every mm -hmm. month and so on. Every once in a while you'd get called up, you'd have to go up to Fort Indian Town Gap and spend a weekend up there on the reserve. So not much to that except to keep up with what the current regulations were and that sort of thing. Sure. So then you made the transition to civilian life and yes. you started a career with the Pennsylvania State Police, right? So eventually Eve eventually okay <laughs> <laughs> so what made you then want to choose that as your career all right uh, I was working in a butcher shop in my hometown there before I went into service and it was a requirement that you could go back to your previous employer after you got out of the service so I went back there and uh, had a potential prudential insurance agent came to try to sell me some insurance because my GI insurance had lapsed and he said, how much are you making here in the butcher shop? And I told him, and he said, well, you can come and be a prudential insurance agent. You can make this much. And I about fell over. I didn't realize you could make that much money in a week. <laughs> so I took that job, uh, and I was had what was called my debit area in northern Chester County, the entire northern Chester County. And uh, I just didn't feel I was doing a good job with prudential. So I thought I had only been out of the service long enough that I could go back in at my current at my former rank. So I was thinking about re-enlisting in the service, and I didn't know where to go, but I knew there was a National Guard armory in Westchester. So I'm driving down Route 100 from Northern Chester County towards Westchester, and there's a red light at Schoen Road, and uh, I, got, I got stopped with a red light. I looked over to the left, and on the hillside, there's a state police barracks, and I thought, you know what? I could probably do that. And I turned left and went into the state police barracks, and that's how I got in the state police. <laughs> I had never thought of it before, that red light. If that light had been green, I wouldn't be sitting here today. I love that story. That's awesome. So, <laughs> you, you, I guess let's start there. So you drove off, you went to the barracks, and what did they say? They said, I said, I, I would like to become a member of the Pennsylvania State Police. And the sergeant in there said to me, well, you're not good enough to be one of us or you know that this is not the way, place you come to apply. I said, okay, where do I have to go? And he said, Lancaster headquarters. So I got out of the, got in my car and drove up to Lancaster headquarters and talked to the lieutenant up there. And he said, the first thing you have to do is take a driving test and then a written test and see if you've got a high enough scores there that you could actually go and take the formal written test uh, to see how you would do. And at the time, uh, they, they had, the state police had just increased the complement by about 1,200. So there were many, many people that were trying to become uh, troopers. And uh, the test has always been the higher the score, the better chance you had to go. They would take the top ones first. So I scored high enough uh, to go uh, into the academy in May of 1969. At that time, how long was the academy? What was the academy like? The academy was three months at that time. Okay. And because they had increased the complement to 1,200 and they wanted to fill that number as quickly as they could. So today, uh, when the academy class is six months, they have weekends off. At the time when I was going there, our day started at six in the morning and, di and didn't end until 10 at night. So they were cramming the courses in during that three month period of time there. Mm -hmm. uh, very interesting, very so, interesting. So then what was policing like back then and what was the focus of training then? Because I imagine it's probably different than in what they're focusing on now. Uh, and somewhat, uh, of course, the, the vehicle code and the crimes code, there was a difference in those. There's been changes in those over the years. Uh, policing, when I was first assigned out of the academy, I was assigned to Troop R in Dunmore and went to the Honesdale Station, which is in Wayne County, still there, uh, for my first 30 days of training. Then I went to Milford uh, in Pike County, uh, which is now the Blooming Grove Station, uh, for the next 30 days, and I ended up staying there uh, for three years until 1973 when I came back. At times, in Wayne and Pike Counties, the trooper who was on duty was the only police officer on duty in the entire county because uh, there was not a full-time police department in Honesdale. There was not a full-time police department in Milford. Those were the only two large boroughs in each one of those counties. And many times uh, those were part-time police departments that just didn't have anybody working. So the trooper that was on duty sometimes was the only police officer on duty in the entire county. My so that was very interesting when you get a call when you're in one end of the county to respond to something at the other end of the county. But at the time also, 
troopers lived in the barracks. Like I, you, you would go up there and you would be working what we called a triple header. You'd work 8 to 4, uh, 11 to 7, uh, 3 to 11. So you do triple header, triple header, triple header. So there was a lot of troopers living in the barracks at the time. If something came up where there was a more urgent need, somebody would get up and get dressed and get a car and go out and respond to that as well. So wow. today, uh, my daughter's on the job. Uh, she's a corporal at Emeryville. She's the crime unit supervisor at Emeryville. I was in the crime unit at Emeryville many years ago. I never thought that my daughter would have been my boss <laughs> at that time. <laughs> but good for her. <laughs> but uh, I, I think in general, policing uh, is somewhat different today because I honestly think there's much less respect for police officers today than what there was back in the 60s and 70s and 80s and so on. Uh, the officers themselves, uh, I believe, are trained in a way that r recognizes the fact that they may be doing a more dangerous job than what they used to do. When I first went on the job, there was no body armor worn at all. We wore a Class A uniform all the time. Today, uh, it's, it's more relaxed as far as the uniform because of the need to be able to respond more quickly and, and, and protect yourself against some threats, unfortunately. Sure. So my dad was a police officer for 30 years mm. in Norristown and my husband is a trooper now yes. so I have <laughs> big respect for anybody that chooses this as a professional because it's so important and it's so difficult now just like you said I mean with the lack of respect for law enforcement it's just it's a tough job so you know shout out to all the law enforcement officers out there. Um, did you ever coming from the old guard and the experience there did you ever have a desire to work for the PSP ceremonial units. I know there are some similarities, I think. PSP ceremonial unit did not exist until oh. maybe a dozen or so years ago. Uh, it didn't exist even when I retired from the state police in 1998. It, it did not exist at that time. Really? So wow. anything that was done as far as funerals, it was f troopers from the local barracks who went out and just practiced for a little bit about what to do and went out and did it. There was no ceremonial unit at that time. Wow. I didn't know that. That's really interesting. So then what was your pr career progression like? You you started out and you moved to a crime unit, but what was it like? Because you, you climbed the ladder of the state police all the way up to lieutenant colonel, correct? Yes, deputy okay, So what was, yes. that, what was that uh, career progression like? Interesting. Well, I uh, was assigned up in Pike County uh, in for three years until finally I was able to get a preference transfer to come back down here to Troop J. Uh, which is Lancaster Troop. At the time, the Downingtown station was the Troop J local station, and then they went to Emeryville. I started off in patrol at Downingtown, a little time at patrol at Emeryville after they moved out there a couple years, and then I spent the, about 12 years in the uh, crime unit out there uh, as an investigator. I really enjoyed doing that. And every once in a while, the state police would have a promotion exam, a written exam and so on, uh, for, because they needed to promote people. And I remember a trooper saying to me one time, uh, George, I know you're studying for the, this test. Can I come and study with you? Well, I wasn't studying for the test because I was really enjoying the job that I was doing. So he came out and we studied together. And I got a score on the test that would have put me right on the edge of possibilities. Maybe I'll get promoted and maybe I won't. Well, I said to myself, if I get promoted, this will never happen again. So every time after that, when the opportunity came up for promotion testing, I studied very, very hard, and I was able to score high enough that I got promoted each time after that. So I became a, a, a when I became a corporal, I was the platoon, a, a platoon a supervisor uh, at Emeryville. I stayed there, and then I became the patrol sergeant at Emeryville after I got promoted to sergeant. And when I got promoted to lieutenant, I became the crime section commander in Lancaster headquarters. And from there, I went to the academy to form the state police special emergency response team and the state police canine unit that exists today. They didn't exist at that time. So it was my job to create those things back then in 18, 1987 and 88. And then from there, uh, I went, well, I was promoted to captain and assigned to the commanding officer in Troop K, Philadelphia. Uh, and that was the time when the riots occurred at Camp Hill. So I spent some time up there at Camp Hill and the riots, 
then came back to Philadelphia, was fortunate enough to get promoted to major, was made the uh, Bureau of Criminal Investigation, Director of Bureau of Criminal Investigation, and from there uh, was promoted by Governor Ridge in 1995 to Lieutenant Colonel, Deputy Commissioner of Staff. That's, uh, that's incredible. I mean, you went through that in like a minute, but that's incredible that you made it that far because there aren't that many lieutenant colonel positions in the state police, correct? It's not like the Army where there's, there's a lot more, right? There's, you know, maybe one per battalion. In the state police, there, there are three. three deputy right. Commissioner of Operations, Deputy Commissioner of Staff, and Deputy Commissioner of Administration. Uh, so I was a Deputy Commissioner of Staff, which was responsible for several of the bureaus, like the Bureau of uh, Research and Development, the uh, uh, what they call it, the the lawyers, where the lawyers were, mm -hmm. I forget what the name of it was at that time, uh, and responsible for the budget and that sort of thing. So that was a very interesting time as well. Yeah, so how did you use your Army experience um, to kind of, you know, uh, carve the path out to this promotion? Like, did you use what you learned um, in the old guard in the Army to kind of supplement what you're doing in the state police to get you to that level? Well, uh, awareness was one thing that you were very uh, conscious of when you were a sentinel at the tomb, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I was serving a as an officer, I always was watching my back and watching what was going on all around me as well. So I, I, I think I took some of that training into place. Uh, the ability to uh, continue to perform even uh, under difficult circumstances, you know, like in bad weather and uh, if you hadn't eaten for 24 hours and things like that, what you did what you had to do. So I think the military was good uh, at first of all at giving me the focus I needed to study the, all the manuals in the state police that you needed to study that were going to be on the promotion test as well. I used to know those things almost word for word. I had, I had a mental picture when the question was asked on the promotion test, I had a mental picture of looking at the answer to that question in the crimes code or the, you know, the field regulations manual or something like that. I could just see it there, you know, because I studied that hard. And I think that comes from uh, some of the military training as well. Be very mm -hmm. conscious. Yeah. And you mentioned, I don't want to skim over this part, you mentioned that you created the, the canine program? Yes. How do you go about creating a program, the state police? That seems like that would be a huge undertaking. Well, well, it was. Uh, there was a position call that, that, that they created specifically to form the state police and special emergency response team, would be known as the SWAT team elsewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, when Governor Ridge was there, uh, Jay Cochran was the commissioner and he was from outside the state police. He had been, a, I believe, a, an FBI uh, officer, high-level officer, was chosen by Governor Ridge to be the state police commissioner. And he realized, oh, you don't have a SWAT team here, you don't have canines here, let's create those programs. So Governor Ridge said, okay, let's get somebody to do them. They put out a request for uh, fo information from people who would be interested, and I submitted, and I fortunately was chosen and was able to do that. So uh, I studied with many police departments around the country about how their SWAT teams worked, uh, worked very closely with the Maryland State Police uh, as well, and took a lot of examples of best practices and put them all together into the State Police and we formed a special emergency response team. And then uh, it was clear that we, there was no canine unit in the State Police. If you needed a canine uh, to try to find explosives or narcotics or something like that, we'd have to go to a local police department to, to, to get them. So the governor decided and the commissioner decided they want to form a canine unit in the state police as well. So the first one was for uh, narcotics detection exclusively, and then later on it expanded into other areas as well. Wow, so you, you have such an interesting career, all of these developing programs and the way you climbed up the ladder. What? What's the highlight of all this? Like, what, what, if you had to pick one, one thing, or maybe a couple things, if you can't think of one, what would that highlight of your career be there? Well, well one of the highlights was when I was the director of Bureau of Criminal Investigation, uh, any new legislation that needed to be uh, done uh, to improve the legislative situation or the laws in Pennsylvania would come to the Bureau of Criminal Investigation if it had to do with police work. 
And so I was able to write many of the laws. I actually wrote the, the, uh, the statute that today is the uh, Protection from Abuse Act. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, several others as well. So some of the highlights were able to be put changes into place that needed to be done that and working with the legislature to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Impressive. Really, yeah. really impressive. So what year did you retire from the state 1998. police? 1998. 1998. So then from 1998 on, what did you do? Did you go to another career? I mean, <laughs> after all that amazing stuff, yeah. it probably was hard to kind of just relax. <laughs> well, in 1998, when I retired, um, I was the chief detective in Chester County here, the county detectives, the chief of county detectives. And then I was approached by uh, the Institute for Intergovernmental Research that I had become familiar with when I was a major in the state police because I was the uh, chair of the policy board for the Mid-Atlantic Great Lakes Organized Crime Law Enforcement Network, which was a federal Department of Justice program uh, for information sharing with federal, state, local, and municipal and tribal uh, law enforcement agencies. And uh, I got called by the Institute for Intergovernmental Research and asked if I would uh, go to work for them uh, as, in, as the director of the uh, information technology side of the regional information sharing systems. I had gotten very attracted into information technology back in the early 80s when it first started, when Commodore Computer was in Westchester. You know, I bought a Commodore 64, then I bought a Commodore 128, and you could actually go over to Commodore and ask them questions, and they'd take you in the back room, put you in a white outfit, and they'd sit down with their scientists and ask you a lot of questions about how you use their computer programs, and they would actually learn from a user that way. So anyway, I was very into uh, computer science at that time and in the state police in 87 I was I spent some time down at the FBI National Academy and one of the courses they offered was information technology and so on but he, the requirement was that you couldn't take that course because it was a high level course and you had to have a certain level of responsibility or, or familiarity before you could be assigned to the course so I applied got a call at the Academy that's when I was assigned at the Academy and they said to me you know, okay, ask me everything, questions on the resume. Is this true? Is that true? Is that true? Uh, I said, yeah, that's true. They said, okay, you can, you can go into the course, but you have to help teach it, you know? So, <laughs> because at the time, I was using WordPerfect, and I'd l learned WordPerfect when it was part of satellite software and in Yoram, Utah, and you could call those folks on the phone and talk directly to the site. Anyway, uh, the FBI had decided that they were going to standardize on Word perfect and never change from it. So that wasn't a good idea. So I talked to him. So I had an opportunity to do a little bit of teaching down at the FBI Academy as well for a short period of time while I was a member of the class. Anyway, uh, where was I? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm bouncing around here. So, oh, okay. So then I, be, I be, went to, to, to work for the Regional Information Sharing Systems Program, and shortly after that, 9 11 happened. And it was pretty clear that, that it probably 9-11 could have been prevented if the different police agencies that had bits and pieces of information had been able to share that information, put it together, discover what was about to happen, and prevent it from happening. So the idea was to work closely with federal, state, local, and tribal law enforcement agencies to try to get their computer information systems compatible with each other so they could share information. Mm -hmm. So I did that for 14 years. Uh, until I finally <clears throat> was in uh, at a conference one time and Sheriff Welsh from the Chester County Sheriff's Office asked me if I would be able to recommend anybody who could be her chief deputy sheriff uh, here in Chester County. <clears throat> and I gave her a couple names and one of those names I gave her said, well, why don't you ask George? He might be your <laughs> chief deputy. So she got asked me and I said, okay. I'll become your chief deputy. So I ended up as the chief deputy sheriff in Chester County for four years before I finally thought, I, you know, I'm still able to do anything I want to do. I don't want to keep working until I can't do it. I want to quit now so I can. So I did. 48 years in law enforcement. <clears throat> wow. That's, that is incredible. 
Yeah. So in 48 years, you probably learned a lot, yes. <laughs> like leadership, you know. Um, so what leadership lesson or tip do you have to give to our audience? All right. I will tell you one in particular. I, well, maybe two. I think it's important for people in leadership positions, whether they are at supervisory positions or in high leadership positions, to recognize and appreciate the work that's being done by their subordinates. And I never considered people to be subordinate. They were partners. They worked with me, you know. Uh, they weren't lower level people. They were, I came up as one of them. I'm still one of you. It's to recognize that and make them aware that you really appreciate what they're doing and say thank you, not only verbally, but one of the things I used to do, I used to have a little thank you card that I, that I would actually write a very short thank you note. I read your report here, excellent writing, great job, or I heard what you did out there when you were doing this or that, sent them a little note. People tell me today, you know, I still have that note you sent me you know, 25 years ago uh, about thanking me for something. It was such a little thing, I never thought I would, you know, and you said thank you. The other thing is this. I remember being at uh, the Limerick Station when I was a commanding officer at Troop K in Philadelphia. And I was talking to the station commander down there about something that they were doing down there, and I made a suggestion to them about how they might be able to change it to be, do it a little bit differently. And he said, you know what, if it ain't broke, you don't have to fix it. And I said, you know, if that idea was always put in place, we would still be driving Model A Fords. We wouldn't be driving, you know, brand new cars today. Mm -hmm. Model A Fords weren't broke. If you didn't, you know, if you had the attitude, it ain't broke, don't fix it, we'd still be driving Model A Fords. So... Always be on the, on the lookout for opportunities to improve. Even if things are going well, look for the opportunities to maybe make some small improvements. Not only, not for your sake, but for the sake of the people who are working with you and for the sake of the people who they work with. Yeah, that's a great tip. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. And thank you for being a guest today. This has been <clears throat> really remarkable, honestly, probably one of my favorite <laughs> interviews that I've done because you, it's just like you're you're like living history and I think that's really cool so thank, oh, thank you, you so much George and to the mm -hmm. audience please like and subscribe to our channel we really appreciate all of that and you can get great content like this like this is what you get if you like and subscribe <laughs> to our channel you know it's very valuable stuff so thanks again George and you're welcome. we'll catch you on the next one thank you I appreciate <laughs> the opportunity